Welcome to the project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship at the Kennedy School of Harvard University. I'm Karl Kaiser and along with Erika Manuzelis, I'll chair this seminar. Russia's invasion uh, into Ukraine brought about a collapse of the post-war European security order and uh, has cre created profound profound changes and ended a system which was based on certain agreed principles, such as respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity, which Russia, then the Soviet Union, once signed. We are now in the midst of an atrocious 19th century war of aggression fought in a system of the 21st century interdependence, interdependence of economics, of environment, of health. This is a what uh, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz called a Zeitenwende, a, a true watershed, and it had a profound impact on Germany, which reversed decades of policy on the European Union, which took new measures on the US administration, which in an extraordinary revival of leadership, united NATO uh, against Russia and in assistance uh, to Ukraine. We want to use the seminar to look at the implications. Although the war goes on its, in its daily brutality and then although the outcome is still very much open, we want to look at the impact on German policy, on European Union policy, and, and of course, on the policies of the West as a whole. And if we have time uh, at the geopolitics uh, of the globe. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have three experts, colleagues and friends who will guide us in this endeavor. And since we have very little time, I will introduce them only very briefly. From Europe, we have Daniela Schwarzer. She is head of the uh, Eurasian section of the Open Society Foundation and formerly was director of the German Council on Foreign Relations. And secondly, we have Wolfgang Ischinger, who was ambassador of Germany to the, to the United States and many years the head of the Munich Security Conference until a few weeks ago. And from the United States, we have Joseph Nye, distinguished professor, university professor here at Harvard, former dean of our school, and holder of numerous posts in former administrations. Each of them will give a brief assessment of how they see the situation at the moment. And after that, we will have a discussion. And uh, Daniela uh, will start. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much, Erika, for, for having us tonight. It's a joy to be with you. So, Carl, I will give you my brief assessment first of the war, but then also of the European response, because I think that's uh, what we wanted to discuss tonight in particular. Now, as you have said, we are in a very brutal war, which over the past weeks hasn't, mu hasn't moved as much as one would have thought. So the quick win that Vladimir Putin seems to have been dreaming of didn't materialize, which is the result of an enormous mobilization in Ukraine and an evolving and growing support in terms of arms deliveries and financial support from uh, European neighbors, the United States and other countries in the world. So right now, Russia has taken territory, notably in Ukraine's east and in the south, has tried to get as much access to the Black Sea as possible. But there also have been successes of uh, the Ukrainian troops in actually regaining territory. So if you today look at a map of Ukraine and you look at the colors, uh, the occupied territory today is smaller than it was uh, one or two weeks ago. So uh, the, I think the most important strategic uh, success of uh, Ukraine was that they protected their capital, Kiev, 
and that they prevented Russian troops from actually controlling access to the Black Sea. So while the territory east of uh, Crimea is occupied to the west, uh, including the city of Odessa, for example, uh, Ukraine still hold it. So this is, you know, a very brief uh, situation analysis, but what is really striking is really the mobilization, not only the number of Ukrainians uh, who joined the official uh, sort of military and are, are in military service now, but also the very many uh, citizens who protect their villages uh, partially really with their own means. Um, and we see quite a lot of uh, international support um, officially for the government, as I have mentioned, but also quite unofficially, you know, uh, the delivery of helmets of, uh, you know, small weapons and other things that come into the country and, and travel across the border to support in particular the more informal uh, groups that have you know, had successes in protecting um, some villages and citizens in Ukraine. Russia has bombarded also Ukraine's west, um, in particular military um, uh, areas which are used for the delivery of arms um, and where they may have suspected that international support for the Ukrainian military gathers. Um, but other than that, uh, they, you know, the fires have mostly concentrated on, on the east and the south, as I have described. Now, the way Europe has reacted, I think, is, is remarkable in many, many ways. First of all, Europe was prepared for this war, and I would say thanks to uh, the United States. Not only have the US engaged with Europe uh, very intensely, over the month preceding uh, the beginning of the war on handling Russia. If, if you remember last summer, uh, the Biden government still tried to convince uh, the German government, uh, then still Merkel, to actually stop Nord Stream 2, which didn't happen. But it actually prepared the grounds, in my view, that when the troops build up on the eastern border of Ukraine and Russian troops were there in a, you know, numbers of 120,000 and more, uh, Europeans were in a very intense dialogue with the US side. The disclosure of intelligence that the Biden administration decided to pursue, in my view, really changed minds in Europe and created a sense of alertness and risk, uh, you know, awareness that hadn't existed before. Um, the German government said at some point, it never mentioned Nord Stream 2, but started saying everything is on the table when it came to the question, what will Europe do? What will Germany do if Putin really starts that war? So there was an attempt to deter Russia by uh, actually showing that Europe and the US were united on very, very robust sanctions. But as we all know, this did not help. However, the preparation was done. And so once the war began, the response from the U European side and the US was A, fast, and B, very well coordinated. Uh, to date, there has been no moment where a country in the EU really and visibly to the public tried to block the next level of sanctions. Um, this may change after the elections in Hungary, which are going to be held uh, next Sunday. So on top of sanctions, we see uh, strong dynamics in the field of military cooperation, defense uh, cooperation. Europe launched uh, a new form of structured defense cooperation in the year 2018. Those were Trump years and Europe had the feeling suddenly that it needs to take more care of itself and build its own contribution to NATO in a more robust way. And building on what was sort of decided then, uh, just this March, a strategic document called the Strategic Compass was published, which contains firstly, a very clear risk assessment, which was rewritten in the days before its publication to up Russia in this risk assessment and also to include China in the second place, given China's undecided um, position at the time. Now I think it's becoming clearer where it is. Um, and then also outlining the very next steps of practical cooperation. I'll close with a remark on Germany, not to be too long, but you spoke about the Zeitenwende, this really sea change in thinking about 
security and defense policy. Germany fundamentally revised its thinking about Russia and its approach towards Russia. I'm not saying the job is totally done. There's still a debate uh, about whether you know, we could possibly return to old times and whether once the war stops, uh, the old ties could be revived. But I personally think we have crossed that line. Uh, the uh, efforts to reduce energy dependence are substantial. I do not think that the German, any German government will go back to the situation where we were still in a few weeks ago. And then defense spending has been substantively increased. Not only do we meet the 2% uh, NATO target as of this year, but there's also an investment fund of 100 billion euros, which partially covers the 2%, yes, but which allows Germany, first of all, to fulfill its given commitments with the NATO and the EU, but then on top of that, actually invest in more projects. Um, Olaf Scholz, our chancellor, clearly situated those stronger defense efforts in an EU context and highlighted in his really historical speech, which he gave to parliament in a special session on a Sunday three weeks ago, he said, we will cooperate very closely, in particular with France. So this is a nod to our most important and largest neighbor, whom we will now overtake clearly in, in terms of defense expenditure. Um, and possibly also in terms of military capabilities at some point. And this definitely shifts the dynamics within the European Union, where the roles were always distributed in a way that Germany leads on the economy and France on defense. France, of course, is still the only uh, nuclear power in the EU, but nevertheless, that old balance is now changing. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, Wolfgang, would you like to follow? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hope you can. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for including me in this um, in this important discussion. And uh, having listened to Daniela, I want to just add a couple of kind of footnotes to this. First, um, just to echo what you said in the beginning, Carl. Uh, what we thought we had erected, beginning with the Helsinki final act in 1975, with the Charter of Paris in 1990, with subsequent uh, all sorts of documents, including the NATO-Russia founding act, um, whatever we had thought in terms of having created a sufficiently stable European security order or architecture, it is now, it has now been shattered. And quite frankly, I think it was shattered in 2014 and not in 2022. 2022 was simply the second phase, the more brutal, as Daniela pointed out, full-scale type of war. Whereas in 2014, it was sort of a kind of a, the attempt to conduct a war without really conducting a war, uh, a hidden war, no less, a no less dramatic break with all the rules that we had thought had been established. In other words, what I want to say first and foremost is we are now in a way at ground zero of European security. And we need to start at some point in the future from scratch. Because the one thing that's certain is Russia will not go away. Uh, Ukraine will continue to have a neighbor by name of Russia. We, Europe will have an, a neighbor by name of Russia. And the question of how to organize our relationship in the longer term is not going to go away. But we need to start from scratch. Second point, very quickly, also to echo what Daniela has said. Thank God we had a guy in the White House who understands where Kiev is and where Berlin is and who is a committed transatlanticist. I hate to even think I get a nightmare when I think where we would be today if Donald Trump had won this election. Um, this, of course, raises important questions. It raises for European strategic minds the question, so what if in the next phase, in the next election, a kind of a 
Donald Trump type figure gets himself elected in the United States. Do we have for that kind of eventuality, do we Europeans have a plan B if we're going to be told that we'll be, we'll be alone from now on? I don't think we have a plan B, but we need to start thinking about it. Third point, so I want to really thank um, what I thought was speaking as a practitioner, absolutely near perfect, admirable US diplomacy in the run up to this war for, over the last number of months and, um, and certainly continuing through the last uh, month or so of this uh, Russian war in, uh, in Ukraine. Third remark, I would strongly advise uh, not to believe that this war is going to, to be over anytime soon. I don't think it's been decided, even if some observers believe that Russia has suffered a significant uh, defeat in terms of losses of equipment and men, etc., in the many thousands. Um, but Russia has a lot of uh, backup resources uh, up their sleeves. So it's not over yet. And uh, by, the, by the way, military experts will tell us and have told us that um, attacking an advancing Russian tank column is actually easier if you are the defender uh, than attacking uh, a Russian tank column that is entrenched, that, that has been dug in, uh, that is, uh, um, uh, because then all of a sudden uh, you are, uh, as the Ukrainian defender, you're going to be on the offense needing to attack um, the entrenched Russians. So the, the, the way this war will be conducted, it's not over. Um, and I warn against that. Uh, third, next, last point. Um, even if we are now in a war situation, even if we Europeans and you Americans are not active parties in this conflict, but we are of course all supporting one side in this conflict. Even if that is now our main concern, how to contribute to an outcome of this conflict that will not be detrimental to the uh, territorial integrity interests, et cetera, et cetera, of Ukraine. Even if all of that is true, we need to start thinking about what elements would need to be on the table if we're looking at how to create a more long-term um, relationship uh, that would not be a continuing, dangerous, open, confrontational uh, military relationship uh, with Russia. I think, for example, just to throw out one point of uh, the question of what could we uh, put on the table or how could we formulate a demand uh, in the future uh, to end the presence of certain ballistic uh, missile systems in um, uh, Kaliningrad, uh, which are threatening uh, significant parts of Western Europe, including, of course, the German capital of Berlin. Um, in other words, these questions of uh, uh, military balance, including, by the way, uh, nuclear weapons, um, future possible possibilities of confidence building and arms control, need to be thought through, even if at the moment this seems to be not, uh, not a good moment uh, to that to do that. Finally, um, just one afterthought. Um, if this crisis produces an opportunity for building a stronger EU in terms of military awareness, in terms of military capabilities, Daniela has mentioned that, I just want to add the very simple point. If if, if we are not going to be able to use this inflection point, this historic Zeitenwende, um, to try to move uh, the European Union um, 
up in terms of capabilities to be seen as a political actor, as a security actor, then we uh, deserve to be called a union that is that has missed the boat. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the European Union to, um, to get its act together and to think about how it can be a more meaningful provider of security for its own purposes, for our own borders, for our own countries, uh, but also reaching out beyond the, the borders of Europe. In other words, to be a more meaningful partner to the United States going forward. I think this is a historic moment of immense importance and I hope will uh, we'll be uh, sufficiently you know, prepared to deal with it uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, and thank you in particular for pointing to the questions of the future. Joe, would you like to add your comments to how you see it? Well, I agree very much with Daniela and Wolfgang about the dramatic impact on Europe as they've described it. So let me try to put Europe within a larger global framework uh, because I agree with what they've said and there's no sense just repeating it. If you look at um, uh, February 24th and ask, was it a turning point in Europe? Absolutely. Um, was it a turning point in a global order? I think it's a little bit more open question. Uh, clearly, it was a turning point in the uh, agenda of world politics. Uh, you know, we're all talking about things that are very different than we were talking about on February 23rd. Uh, the pivot to Asia doesn't look so dominant anymore, for example. Um, so no question that, that February 24th changed the world agenda. And it also, um, if we think of its effect on world order, we have to distinguish between order in terms of the normative structure and institutions and order in terms of the underlying balance of power, or the distribution of power. In terms of the effect on the normative structure, I think it's still an open question. It'll depend in part on how this turns out. If, um, if Putin were to go on for a year or two and prevail and let's say divide uh, uh, Ukraine along the deeper and do a Korean solution sort of uh, whatever, uh, then the basic norm uh, that's been present since 1945, which is uh, sovereignty and respect for territorial integrity, and you don't invade your neighbor to steal their territory, and if you use force, it has to be under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. That that norm is still crucial. Uh, and if Putin fails, that norm will hold, even though, as Wolfgang said, it was first violated in 2014. The violation wasn't big and clear enough to, to uh, do real damage. Um, but if Putin succeeds or prevails uh, in uh, Ukraine, then I think we'll have uh, very serious damage. So far, what we've seen is a surprising degree of support in the UN General Assembly. Most smaller countries, post colonial countries, care very much about sovereignty. And this basic norm, the post 45 norm, is important to them. So I think this is going to be a, 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 an open question, uh, but uh, uh, I still remain somewhat optimistic uh, that we'll preserve that norm. The third dimension of, of change, though, is the one I referred to as the underlying balance of power, structure of power in world politics. And there, I don't think the change has been as great as it has been in the agenda of world politics. And I say that because I think what you see is, uh, if anything, a strengthening of the West. Um, it, it, the extraordinary um, ability of uh, Europe and the United States to come together, I think has meant that though it's always been true that when you add Europe and the US and Japan together, uh, we greatly exceed Russia and China added together. The big question was, well, would the three act together? And I think that is a big change in terms of making it credible that the three 
largest democracies, which are also the three largest economies in the world, can act together. So I think in that sense, um, there's been a slight change for the better, not for Ukrainians, but for the West in terms of uh, uh, the global structure of power. Uh, in addition to that, of course, um, Russian power has, uh, has been greatly diminished. Um, if you look at Russian military power, the, uh, the myth of Russian military power has suffered a severe puncture. Uh, even if Putin were to prevail in some of his objectives, uh, the, this view of the invincible uh, Russian army is, is no longer there. The second um, point where Russia has been badly hurt, of course, is its economic power through the sanctions. Um, and the third point uh, is Russia's soft power or its ability to attract others. And there, I think uh, Russia has also ser seen serious decline. Interesting to me, if you again put this in the global context, is I think China has been hurt by this, uh, not in terms of military or economic power directly, but in terms of its soft power and the uh, alleged alliance that it had uh, with Russia. People were talking, uh, you know, a year ago or so about, uh, uh, you know, the, the axis of autocracies and the east west prevail, east wind prevailing over the west wind and so forth, uh, you're not gonna see that to the same extent. So that Chinese uh, propaganda about the east prevailing over the west, I think is, is, has been damaged. So, so I would say that, uh, again, to summarize, um, a huge change in the agenda of world politics and uncertain change on the norms, the basic norms of world politics, though I, my suspicion is that that's not going to be as big as we thought. Uh, and the third thing on the underlying structure of power, uh, a slight change in favor of the West. But I think that leads us to where Wolfgang brought us, which is we need to start thinking the future. I fear uh, that this war may go on for some time, but even so, it's never too soon to start asking the questions that Wolfgang asked. How are we going to integrate Russia, uh, whether it's a Putinist Russia or a post-Putin Russia? Uh, as he said, uh, uh, Daniel indicated as well, we've got to live with it. So what role are they going to play? The second big question is, um, what's going to be the role of China in Europe? Uh, there was beginning to be a degree of, of uh, tightening of relations between the US and Europe regarding China. Uh, I would think that this is another one which we're going to have to look at pretty carefully. Uh, Wolfgang and I were involved in a, in a study, as you were too, Carl, uh, trying to talk about this uh, well before February 24th. And the, uh, the third big question is the one about the US role. Uh, the idea that Europe is going to be stronger is, is a tremendous gain, uh, but it still is going to require a, an American presence uh, for balancing uh, Russia and Europe. And there, I think the, the um, I, I like Wolfgang's counterfactual and what a disaster this would be if Trump, with his uh, uncertainty about NATO had been reelected. Uh, uh, but we have to ask, how are we going to solidify this, uh, this U.S.-European relationship and security? And um, there, the, the, the hint of good news is that there is a great, a much greater bipartisanship on Ukraine than I had expected. Um, and it's dividing the Republican Party. The Trump wing, represented on the television by Tucker Carlson and so forth, is really now in a minority. Um, doesn't mean Trump is a minority in control of the party as a whole, but on foreign policy, uh, it's a well-known fact that about a third of the American public has always been isolationist. And there is a Republican isolationism and a Democratic isolationism. I think the Republican isolationists have uh, been weakened uh, by the Trump's response. And uh, that leaves more grounds for us to start thinking ahead to how the US and Europe are going to organize uh, eventually, as they say, all wars must end. And we have to start thinking 
of how we're going to organize not just Europe, but global order when eventually this war ends. Thank you, Joe. Uh, all wars must end at a, at a point, but in between, and there seems to be agreement among the three of you, it's going to last for a while. And my question in particular to our two Europeans is how consequential is the change and how will it endure under the stress of real pain as the pain will come, for example, on the economic side, energy shortage, increase in prices, um, possibly recession. And my question also, uh, particularly Daniela, who has done a lot of work on the European Union. Um, if you look at the European Union as a, as a group, uh, of course, everybody will increase defense efforts. Um, but isn't there a danger that it will be national, that the increasing capacity will increase national capacities and that the necessity for joint action and joint capabilities will suffer. Uh, the compass mentions strategic autonomy. What, what do you think that means given the circumstances at the moment as we, as we re, re, reconsider the European posture in this changed environment? I, I wonder what, what, what you, how, how you assess the how consequential it is going to be. Daniela or Wolfgang, whoever. Daniela, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, um, first of all, I do think there is a change. And as I outlined a little earlier, this change is not only a reaction to this war, but as I said, it started in 2018. It was very much a reaction to doubts about uh, this, you know, the, the reliability of, of US security guarantees. I mean, the problem for Europe is whatever they do now won't have any substantial effect before 15 or even 20 years if they start, you know, with new big projects. However, I do think there's something meaningful happening. And that is really trying to work together in a better way in the short term, to increase Europe's ability to act. And this is first of all, you know, what this needs is first of all an analysis, why should we? And then secondly, the ability to decide to do something. And then in that regard, the strategic compass sets, you know, the backdrop against which now the EU member states will assess uh, the still evolving security environment. And also, it you know very clearly says, and this is in the EU treaties for a long time, has been there for a long time, um, Europeans don't have to act as a group of 27. They can act in smaller groups. And this is really what I see happening. Um, I think we also need to think about defense cooperation in the EU, not only in the context of the war that Russia is waging in Ukraine, but also, a, you know, a recent example where Europeans could have done more but didn't and that is Afghanistan and the evacuation efforts where if you asked Europeans could you have secured Kabul airport in terms of military capabilities yes in terms of getting things there deciding quickly enough being there actually and being willing to to be there and take the risks obviously no um, that is why Europeans simply had to follow whatever the US decided. But this has left traces, I believe. And taking all of this together, I think there's a real thinking about European capabilities and the ability to do something. I would not put too much emphasis on the term strategic autonomy. First of all, because I'm very well aware how in the US it is sometimes over or misinterpreted in the sense of Europe turning away from the US, from NATO, which is in no way the case and shouldn't be the case because it would take so long for Europe to actually be strategically autonomous that it would be a huge risk to declare it and then not be able to, to live up to it. So I very much prefer uh, two other terms. One is European sovereignty, meaning we should be able to take sovereign decisions and follow through if we make them. Um, and the other one is really the capacity to act, which I have outlined as a very practical question. Do we agree? Can we decide practically to do something? And do we have the means to implement? Um, Carl, I would like to also 
quickly answer your concerns about public support or political support for this new era we are in and the policies that go with it. Yes, they will be very costly. Obviously, the big investment into defense has, brings opportunity costs. This money, yes, part of it will be raised in the market, but also eventually it won't be spent on other things. So this requires a very strong and constant political leadership explaining, in particular in a public like Germany, where there is no big strategic debate. There is no big concern about security. Um, now, of course, because of the war in Ukraine, there is. But in order to change a trend in public opinion, it takes far longer than just a few weeks. So at the moment, the support for those policies is there, but we do not know how things will look in a year's time. And obviously the costs that come uh, through energy prices, the price level of which is already very high, but could be higher in the future and could require citizens to actually change lifestyle. We have a debate on one of the big taboos in Germany, which may seem ridiculous, but people will care about it. And that's the question of speed limits on German highways. Um, you know, I'm saying this with a smile, but it is actually something that if it comes and it may be reasonable to do, citizens will probably disagree with it. And this, uh, these are small little things. Then you get your monthly bill and your gas is so expensive and so on and so on. Your fuel is so expensive. And we have seen social movements like the yellow vests in France um, that actually picked up on higher fuel costs in that case because of the tax. But still people feel it in their pocket and we should not relax and say, this will be no problem. It might be one, it will vary across countries and within countries. And we are still in the post COVID phase in the recovery phase. Um, and people are worried anyway about the economic future. There are people who argue Europe is heading for a stagflation scenario. So high inflation and zero growth or even negative growth which from a socioeconomic perspective in a post-pandemic recovery phase is obviously the worst you can get. So policymakers really have to brace themselves for difficult times ahead. And this really requires a lot of public leadership to explain why those decisions that will definitely be disputed are still the right ones in the medium and long term. Wolfgang, do you want to add any, anything to this? Just two quick points. First, when a uh, brief reaction to what uh, uh, what was said about China. And I think the China factor is um, uh, going to be very important. I totally agree with what Joe said earlier that the Chinese leadership cannot, absolutely cannot be happy with the conduct of the war in Ukraine. Almost everything that has happened as a consequence of this aggression is uh, detrimental to Chinese interests. The re-emergence of the United States as the Western leader, the unity, uh, at least currently, as currently established of the European Union, the renewed vitality of NATO, et cetera. I, I mean, I, I could go on. This is all the exact opposite of what might conceivably be uh, in the Chinese interest. When we discuss this with the Chinese, and uh, I do remember very precisely the participation of the Chinese foreign minister in the Munich Security Conference a month ago, just three days before the, uh, before, you know, February the 24th, uh, he said, and I thought that might be interpreted as a sign of hope. He said that, yes, China uh, uh, was of the view that the territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine deserved the same respect as the territorial integrity of any other uh, state. But China has continued, obviously, not only to sit on the fence, but to reaffirm its closeness with Russia in spite of what's currently going on. And why are they doing that? I, that's the point I wanted to drive at. They're doing that, at least that is the result of discussions I've had with 
a number of senior Chinese people in recent days. They're, they're doing that because of the United States. When I, when I tell my Chinese friends, look, this is not about the United States, this is about Ukraine. And your belief in the, you know, in the, in the rule, uh, in, in international law, in the Charter of the United Nations, um, and in the territorial integrity of a member uh, uh, country of the uh, United Nations. Their answer is, yes, but we don't want to be seen as siding with the United States. In other words, the Chinese, and this is, will be of no surprise to Joe and to other China watchers, they're obsessed with, with, with their relationship with the United States. And because they don't want to be seen siding with the US, they are now unfortunately driven to side more with the Russian. I think it will be a very, very interesting exercise for Western diplomacy going forward to explain to our Chinese rivals and competitors that they are actually missing a huge opportunity to make China be seen as a, as a uh, you know, as a good uh, country, as a country that is um, trying to use its influence for the for the for for the for the good of mankind, for peace rather than for war. Uh, if China use use just a little bit of its role and influence and power to tell the Russians stop this war, we're not there. But I'm not giving up hope that that uh, might be possible going forward. Uh, very briefly, my second point is I share the concern, I very much share the concern that the degree of unity which we seem to have achieved, which inside my own country, Germany, is, uh, appears to have been achieved, I think that is going to be um, rather fragile going forward. Um, Chancellor Scholz, with one sweeping speech, has forced the Greens to abandon fundamental beliefs that, that, that have been very important to the Greens for, for decades. He has forced his own party to abandon uh, classic social democratic pacifist tendencies. Uh, we're now among the most important weapons deliverers to Ukraine, totally unimaginable as recently as six weeks ago. Um, and that will put for obvious reasons, significant strains on the internal cohesion in uh, parts of this current German uh, coalition. Uh, I don't want to start predicting what the outcome might be, but I'm simply trying to point out, uh, it's great that we have achieved this degree of cohesion inside Germany, uh, within the EU, within NATO, pourvu que ça dure, as the French would say. Let's hope it lasts. Thank you, Wolfgang. And uh, tomorrow there will be a summit between the European Union leadership and the Chinese leadership. And, and hopefully the Europeans will convey to the Chinese how important they are as a market. It's the largest market for the Chinese. And Chinese internal stability depends on a functioning export to the European Union. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, I. I um, wanted to ask uh, Joe a question and then we'll move on to, there are lots of questions now in the chat, uh, uh, related to, uh, again, the future and how to treat Russia as you and others um, uh, were, uh, did touch upon. Um, uh, is it wise to, to create the impression as if the removal of Putin were a goal uh, uh, as loathsome as behavior is, uh, because you do want to keep somebody to communicate with in the future. And, uh, and how does one treat this particular question? Uh, on the one hand, to oppose him. On the other hand, to deal with somebody whom you might need uh, to come to a deal, uh, to, come, to come back to Wolfgang's point on, on arms control, uh, those are the issues that, that will not disappear, nor will the enormously important environmental impact of the largest country of the world 
will disappear as a problem for the for the world community and for communication between well the outside and a russian leader whoever that will be for, but for the time being it's putin and it, and he's likely to to be around well i think your point is well taken carl i i i sympathize emotionally with biden's statement uh, about uh, putin uh, and even though we could all agree with it uh, it's not a thing a president should say. Um, we can all hope that Putin will be seriously defeated. But if not, you've got to remember that you don't get to choose your enemies. And you have to deal with your enemies, whether, you're, whether you would have chosen them or not. So I think that our policy should be uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we don't uh, anathemize Putin to the point that we couldn't do uh, some sort of arrangements uh, for one thing to end the war and stop the suffering of uh, the Ukrainian civilians, but also for thinking about a structure afterwards where uh, weapons are under control, particularly nuclear and, and uh, chemical and so forth. So I, I think your point is well taken. Let, let's say our prayers that Putin goes away but uh, let's remember that um, I understand, yeah. we don't have all the choices. Not all our prayers are answered. Those of you in our relatively large audience who have questions, you can either raise your uh, hand uh, or put your question in the chat. And there are a number uh, of questions already in the chat. There are several that relate to the oil and gas embargo and the question to what extent uh, it is uh, manageable? Uh, can one endure it? Can Germany, for example, manage a total embargo of oil and gas uh, or not? Uh, and we, and of course, linked to that are the, the political implications of uh, sustaining such a policy for, for a while. Do you have any views on that, uh, Wolfgang or Daniela? Um, well, I can make a uh, I can make a brief uh, comment. Um, I hesitated quite a bit for a day, almost for a, day, a full day, and then I did sign an appeal uh, signed, by the way, by Tom Enders, who is now the the chair of the uh, uh, DGAP. Uh, I signed the, too. Yes. But Daniela used to work at where, where, which you ran for, for so many years, and a number of other uh, political and business uh, and, and think tank leaders uh, joined this, this call to end imports of oil and gas right now. Um, in all fairness, I would, I would defend the, Germans, the German government's decision not to follow this. Uh, appeal, but to resist uh, calls for ending imports of oil and gas right now. Why? Because the government believes, and and I don't have the facts to to contradict that. Um, the German government believes that the results would be uh, less uh, effective than some of us believe on Russian decisions but would have rather terrifying effects on the German economic situation. I'm, I've been given to understand that one large chemical company in Germany told the German government, if you close the valve, so to speak, uh, we will report 40,000 people to be out of a job the next day. In other words, uh, major chaos uh, is being threatened, um, and a number of, uh, of important companies in this country are extremely dependent on continuing gas supplies for uh, uh, particular heating and uh, chemical and other processes. In other words, the government has collected all the, all, all the facts and believes that the, 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 the downside in this case outweighs the potential benefits for two reasons, uh, that's the last sentence I want to uh, uh, make on this. Um, 
Russia could easily sell the oil, which we would not import, uh, which we would stop importing on uh, uh, in a functioning global market. There is a, there is a functioning global market for oil. So they might actually continue to get the revenue even if we don't uh, import the oil. With gas, it is a little uh, more difficult. We are very dependent on Russian gas, but the, but the percentage of the, the Russian dependency on, on import, uh, on, on the revenue from, from gas being sold to Germany and others is relatively minor in terms of the overall revenue. In other words, the, the concern is that even if we did what people like myself and others are saying we should do, if even if we did close the valves right now, uh, the Russian war machine could probably continue for quite some, kind, uh, uh, quite some time. The effect would be less impressive than some of us believe, and German businesses would be hurt in a way that would uh, uh, risk you know, domestic stability to a certain extent, full stop. That's a very important point. Daniela or Joe, do you have a comment on, on this question? Let me just say that I'm fascinated by the speed with which Germany is adjusting its energy policy. Um, things are, are really moving. Although the government, as Wolfgang has said, is not following uh, you know, the advice of, of many people. I also, along with Karl and Wolfgang, signed it. Um, and I didn't expect a sort of maximal response to it, but I think the signal, um, at least that I was intending to send with my signature was, we have to be willing to take bold decisions and discuss them as, as far as we think we can go, if we think we need to end the war in Ukraine. And Ukraine needs to win that war. Um, and so that is, I think, a, a strategic debate which we need to have. And wherever you land, if you agree that Russia needs to be defeated in Ukraine, you may, and, and you look at the consequences if you don't, or if that doesn't you know, succeed, what will then be the cost for Europe? You may actually come to a point where you evaluate the factual cost that Wolfgang has very clearly described that will weigh on Germany and others. Um, and the industry reaction to the current debate is very, very clear. So I heard the same thing and I won't name the company, but that is you know, very clearly formulated as a threat in a way or a consequence they would have to draw. But at the end of the day, I think we have to look at the scenario, what is the price for Europe if Russia wins in Ukraine and what follows then? Um, and that's the scenario against which we then have to evaluate what's the price we are willing to bear now and assess whether the price we are willing to bear actually has any consequence. And Wolfgang gave a lot of details um, about, you know, the effectiveness of such an embargo, which yeah. is Right, right. Uh, I have several raised hands and uh, the first one is Alice Shang. And would you please be so kind and unmute yourself and one sentence, who you are. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for hosting this event. And it's so wonderful to, to hear from all the experts and especially seeing um, Professor Joe Nye. I'm a big fan. Um, so my question, oh, so I am uh, I, uh, a HKS uh, graduate student before, and uh, uh, I've uh, been to many of uh, uh, those kind of historical, like applied history uh, events in the past, and, and, and I absolutely enjoy them. So thank you so much uh, for hosting this. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, a few of the speakers mentioned um, China is actually, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the war going on between Ukraine and Russia is uh, causing negative effects on China. So I'm just wondering, um, can, uh, can you expand on that? Because um, in a way that I remember reading, uh, China, uh, Xi Jinping, China's Xi Jinping and Putin have met up uh, during the Olympic time and uh, publicly mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, China and Russia would like to challenge the Western principles. And do you think uh, this is actually one of uh, the ways that China can use this distraction um, you know, against the United States, so China can also challenge the Western principles in other ways. And how is this, you know, considered as a negative side for for China? Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to answer, Joe? 
Well, I think I, I agree very much with what Wolfgang said about China. It's making a huge mistake. Um, if you take the basic norms of the international system, actually the Chinese and Americans agree on the UN charter. Clearly the Russians don't. Uh, the Chinese are thinking not in terms of the normative order, but in terms of the underlying structure of power. And they're thinking America is our primary enemy uh, in uh, you know, balance of power 101. Uh, if there are three major uh, contestants, you wanna be part of the two, not the one. But I think this is a serious mistake on their part. I've, I've just written the Project Syndicate column called China's Missed Opportunity in Ukraine. Uh, and I said, you know, if you look back to, uh, to the Russo-Japanese War where Teddy Roosevelt intervened and pushed hard on the parties to, uh, to come to compromise, it won him a Nobel Prize, but it also increased American influence when the Americans won all that important. Um, Xi Jinping has a Teddy Roosevelt moment, or could, uh, you could turn around this situation dramatically where China would be a winner, not a loser from this whole thing, uh, if they'd seize that moment. Alas, I don't think they have the imagination or courage to do it. Thank you, John. Uh, Leah Zell asked a question in the uh, chat, which I cannot quite read. Leah, would you like to come in and ask your question? Where are you? Um, my question regards the decisions as to what weapons to provide Ukraine and the, the measured way in which weapons are being handed over. Uh, there is an alternate view that you hit Russia hard early, um, as opposed to being a, that's certainly what Zelensky is saying, that we're afraid of provoking Putin. And I'd like to hear uh, about the thought behind um, arming Ukraine and does this way in which it's being done perhaps prolong the hostilities and that will end up having to escalate eventually anyway? Thank you, Leah. Uh, Joe, could, could you try and, and perhaps address the question which uh, many people ask, uh, why, why, why is there this American reluctance um, to, for example, to to pass on uh, fighter planes or to help Poland to pass on its fighter planes to the Russians. Uh, the last thing that, um, this is the argument, the last thing that Putin will want is to have NATO intervene so that he will accept probably such a weapon like he accepts drones or, or stinger, stinger uh, uh, missiles. Well, Biden is working within a, at least question is a very good one. And, Biden is working within a limited political space. He's now got a bipartisan consensus that we want to defend Ukraine. He also has a much wider concern that we not get into a nuclear war with Russia or direct fighting that could lead there. So he's trying to maneuver within that political space to hold together the bipartisan coalition he has. Um, the exact answer to the question about uh, the passing along the MiGs. Uh, I gather the testimony of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is that it uh, wasn't as simple as it first looks. I don't know the details of that, but I certainly think efforts to increase uh, uh, our ability to, uh, to provide weapons soon uh, and quickly to Ukraine is warranted and that that's important. I don't know the exact argument about why the why the planes weren't part of it. The no-fly zone is much easier to answer, uh, but uh, the, the exact details of the planes, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, there is a raised hand, Irv Plotkin. Would you come in and identify yourself? Well, after my clock has identified itself. Uh, yes. Er Er Plotkin, um, MIT trained economist, uh, spent a lot of time at Kennedy School. 
I suppose my question, in a sense, follows from the previous one, uh, and maybe it's more for Professor Nye. Uh, Putin started early to saber, to rattle nuclear sabers. How serious would we have to take that? And do we think that within the military structure in Russia, there is, like there was in the United States, the generals went around Trump when he was rattling a, a nuclear saber and told his people not told the people not to take his orders. If push comes to shove, uh, would Putin be able to play the nuclear game? And what is the feeling in, in the European countries about that? <laughs> well, to answer that question. I can no. spread it, but we should then get to the European side. Uh, if you go back to Herman Kahn and ladders of escalation, Putin has already climbed two rungs on the sure. ladder which are below the explosive level, but the declaratory policy and then the alerting or changing the structure of the forces, these are two ranks or two rungs on the ladder before explosion. The question is, will he take the next step? And the next step, if you think like Khan, would be a demonstration explosion, let's say over the Black Sea or something, uh, just to make sure that people realize that uh, he was not to be trifled with. Uh, and then the step above that would be to use a, a tactical nuclear weapon on um, Ukrainian forces in, let's say, in East Ukraine or something of this sort. Uh, then you can imagine the steps that go on after that. Um, the, the interesting question is, will he halt at the, at the level of the explosion? Um, I was talking to a, uh, a person who was in a position to know this. Um, uh, uh, in the American government, I mean, who been involved with these issues. And um, the comment was that uh, even if Putin is suicidal, um, Shoigu and Gerasimov and the other Sloviki are not suicidal, and that the Russian procedures are not a single button which Putin pushes uh, by himself, but is more complex than that. And that uh, they think this person I spoke to thought that it was unlikely that they, these other Russian um, uh, security people, the Soviki, would agree to it. But again, um, who knows? Many of us were wrong on whether Putin would invade in the first place. And I had a brief comment to that, yep. Carl, just very briefly. Uh, I personally believe that President Biden, the Biden administration has handled this question quite elegantly and has avoided a situation where classic German angst would, um, you know, would, would, would undermine the really good consensus that has been created in this situation. There is a lot of German angst. There has been a lot of German angst, not only in Germany, I imagine, but also in other uh, partner and neighboring countries about this this unsolvable problem of a possible Putin escalation to nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass uh, destruction. And I think the, um, the way the Biden administration, the way the NATO Secretary General has publicly handled the situation has been, has, has created a sense of reassurance we're dealing with professionals who make sure that the signaling to Russia is not going to lead Putin into believing that it would make any sense at this point for him to escalate uh, to this level. The other aspect which seems uh, relevant to me, if you believe that you're dealing with a rational uh, opponent in Moscow, is that it actually makes very little sense to use weapons of mass destruction if your professed um, operational goal is to bring home the Ukrainians, home to the Reich, so to speak, um, because they've, they've been led astray by the CIA and by Western Europe, uh, by decadent Western Europeans. We want to bring them home into the into the Russian fold, using a nuclear weapon 
on Ukrainian territory against essentially Ukrainians uh, would seem to me to end once and for all any hope that anyone in Russia could have of ever re reuniting the Russian people with the Ukrainian people. I mean, this would be the first time a nuclear weapon would have exploded since uh, the days of World War II. And uh, so I think the likelihood is relatively small, but the angst in Germany and elsewhere around uh, Western Europe is unfortunately significant. And I think Biden has dealt with it and Stoltenberg, and they both dealt with this very elegantly and successfully. Daniela, do you want to add anything? No, nope, I agree no? All right. with Wolfgang's view. Mm -hmm. could, could, I, uh, could I invite you to speculate for a moment about the out, a possible outcome? And what should be the Western policy when we, when we deal with Zelensky in, uh, on the outcome? Uh, is that now an accepted uh, proposition that neutrality is the outcome, for example? Or uh, should we say anything as the West on the whole territorial question? Or should we just leave that to the dynamics of what happens on the battlefield? Whom are you asking? Well, would you like to answer? I'm Do you have some thoughts on that? I'm happy to share first your thoughts, yes. Um, so I think it is up to Ukrainians to say what they find acceptable for a, you know, for a peace settlement or, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we can get that far at all. Um, I think if Zelensky wants any government or any political leader to help uh, as a mediator or to, you know, sit with him in negotiations or whatever he may come up with, um, the West should do that. European countries or governments should stand by his side. But I would advise to refrain from any speculation on the side of EU countries, what should be done. Um, I think this is really up to Ukraine. If he wants advice, he can get it confidentially. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, encourage a public debate on this issue or political positioning of, of European leaders. And, um, you know, the, the, it seems that over, over the weeks now, um, there have been certain statements that he or his foreign minister made and neutrality with security guarantees uh, by a number of European countries was one thing that came out of Kiev. And then that is clearly a, a topic on which uh, Europeans can take positions and back him up if they want to and are ready to provide these security guarantees. Right now, the question is obviously up in the open, what would they entail? And to what extent would that then satisfy Russia's interest, uh, which has said among many other things, what it wants from Ukraine, uh, non-membership of NATO. But if you extend security guarantees and you're not in NATO, Russia would probably still be not satisfied with that degree of neutrality. So, so that's my view um, on, on territorial um, questions. Again, I think it is up to the Ukrainian government to say what it finds acceptable. And they have also already mentioned uh, a possible referendum on any settlement they are willing to make with Russia. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good process. Yeah. Wolfgang. Um, yeah, just just to add from a, the point of view of the practitioner, um, negotiations on a peace settlement while sh the shooting is ongoing uh, does not uh, make a lot of sense to me because the fact that the shooting continues as we speak indicates that certainly Russia has not yet concluded that it cannot make additional gains on the battlefield, territorial or other gains. And so long as Russia believes that it can um, successfully use military force, they will not make any meaningful arrangements at the negotiating table. So I think the first step ought to be the ceasefire, if it can be achieved, and then we might have negotiations. Now, what kind of outcome, you, your, your question was, what kind of outcome is most likely? Uh, 
I believe a clear cut outcome of a, you know, of a wonderful peace treaty with, uh, with, a, with a functioning and durable peace settlement is the least likely outcome. I think the most likely outcome is a kind of a Donbass, you know, what uh, situation, the situation we've had for the last eight years uh, with a dividing line that goes somewhere through the Ukraine where shooting may occasionally continue more or less. In other words, I think the most likely outcome is a messy situation that would, that would allow Putin to declare to his home constituency, we have now, you know, eradicated Nazism, uh, the Nazis, um, and we're in control because our forces are present in Ukraine, um, but it would be a, a terribly a negative situation for Ukraine because if there is, uh, is if there is not a stable peace uh, settlement, not a single international company is going to in, to to be wanting to invest in in Ukraine post you know peace settlement etc. And what we of course would like to see would be would be a clear cut settlement uh, on the basis of which we could urge international investors from the United States, from Western Europe, from all over the, the world to help make Ukraine a, a you know, a, a, a prosperous place, uh, a model of, uh, of, of uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, et, et cetera. I'm afraid that we are at this moment quite far from that. The goal, our objective ought to be to work for that. But I think the more likely outcome is a pretty messy situation that could actually last for quite some time. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, do you share that? Well, I, I, I agree. I think uh, uh, Daniela's wisdom is the basic point, which is that uh, the Ukrainians have to make these decisions and anything imposed on them by Europe or by the US wouldn't stick. Uh, but I think Wolfgang is also correct that we're unlikely to see uh, a, a, a real uh, peace treaty. Uh, uh, we should hope, though, to get a ceasefire uh, just because of the killing of civilians has to stop. But we're realizing that when that ceasefire occurs, it's not going to be a problem solved. It's, it's, uh, it's just a way to try to slow the killing of civilians, which is appalling. Well, our time is uh, coming to an end here. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the three of you uh, and those who participated in the debate. So let us hope that the war comes to an end soon and that uh, the Ukrainians have the upper hand. So with that, I would like to thank you and wish you a good evening in Europe and a good day to us here in the United States and be well, bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. much.